Welcome to the Film Entrepreneur Podcast, episode number nine. Everyone's got a plan until you get punched in the face. Mike Tyson. This is the Film Entrepreneur Podcast, where we teach you the top strategies, tactics, and growth hacks that every indie filmmaker needs to know to make money with their films. We are the podcast that puts the business back into show business. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome to another episode of the Film Entrepreneur Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Today's show is sponsored by Black Box. Now, guys, as film entrepreneurs, we're always looking for a little bit of side cash, a little bit of extra revenue streams, and Black Box does that in spades. What they do is allows you to sell your stock footage, you know, footage that's sitting around in your hard drive from old shoots or stuff that you're actually creating for the stock footage market, but it allows you to submit to all the stock footage platforms at once. It handles all the technical submitting and also payments so you can get all your payments out of one platform as opposed to going to all these other places and signing up everywhere. It does it all for you. I've created a really, really nice revenue stream from Black Box and it is a passive revenue stream, which is amazing. So if you want to check it out, head over to blackbox.global to find out more. Today's show is also sponsored by Full Time Filmmaker. Now, Full Time Filmmaker is easily one of the craziest online film schools I've ever seen. It has over 40 hours of stuff and it is amazing. Whether you're just starting out or you've been a filmmaker for a long time, this course really covers a lot. It goes into all the equipment you should buy, the technical aspects of things, the creative aspects, as well as editing. So he has a full course on Premiere Pro, on Final Cut X, Uh, And then also goes really deep into the business of how to make money, steps to making money, sources of revenue, how much you should charge, all of this kind of stuff. It's really about building a business as a filmmaker, shooting a lot of different projects and making a business so you can actually then go after making feature films, television series, or whatever else creatively you want. You can actually make a living doing this. It's pretty amazing. So if you want to check out this course, head over to filmtrepreneur.com forward slash F-T-F. That's filmtrepreneur.com forward slash F-T-F. So guys, I'm super excited about today's guest, Joshua Caldwell. Man. I mean, Josh is, I, I call him my brother in arms, in my, in, uh, my brother in indie film arms because, you know, as I was interviewing him for the, for the show, I just started realizing everything he was saying was like, oh my God, this is like, he's, he's basically saying a lot of the stuff I've been preaching for a while now, but he's put a lot of it in practice. He's made now three feature films, and one specifically that we're going to talk heavily about in this episode is The Layover, or actually just Layover. Uh, Layover was made for 6000 bucks, and he shot it on a, on a DSLR. You know how I feel about DSLRs, but I'm coming around. Again, I always say that DSLRs, are good if you know what you're doing and if you can shoot it properly. And my man knew what he was doing because I saw the trailer for it and it looks really, really good. He really talks a lot about um, really guerrilla stuff, He's stealing every shot you could imagine. I mean, he was in, he basically shot all around LA, went into the, the highest profile locations and just stole shots. He actually went to LAX, shot in LAX, Went on a plane, shot on a plane. I mean, it was it was pretty a pretty great story, and it just shows it shows you that you can go out and do it, and you don't need a million dollars or half a million dollars or anything to go make your movie. He did it. He proved it himself, and he's like, you know what? This is the movie I wanted to make. And by the way, it's a French language. He's not French. He doesn't speak French, but a French language indie film. Uh, basically done for six thousand uh, dollars. No action. I'm not sure about sex, but I don't think there's any sex in it either. Uh, and it's just basically a romp one night throughout L.A. It's pretty, pretty awesome. I, I can't, I can't express to you enough how awesome it was to talk to Josh. And uh, I really was excited to get him on the show and then also to get this information out to you guys. So if you guys are going to make a feature film in the next year or two or even thinking about making a feature film, you've got to listen to this podcast. It will change the way you look at movies and how it make movies, especially in today's world, and the empowerment that you will have 
which again is what I've been preaching all this time with what I've done with This Is Meg, what I'm going to be doing with my future projects, and and so on. And it's it, you. I just want to give you guys the freedom to just go and shoot. And Josh really lays out a great battle plan, a blueprint on how he did it with Layover. And I'm really excited for you guys to hear his story, uh, his antidotes, and all the cool stuff that he's been doing over the last few years. And he also have a common inspirational movie that kind of started us off this on this path, which is For Lovers Only. I've talked about this movie by the Polish brothers uh, and a lot of these those techniques that they were using back then, which is 2010, something like that, 2011, is a lot of stuff that Josh used in this movie and I used in This Is Meg. So without any further ado, I'm not going to talk anymore, guys. I want you guys to hear this uh, interview. Really get ready to listen up and listen to this many, many times because it's very valuable information. Enjoy my conversation with Josh Caldwell. Uh, I'd like to welcome to the show Joshua Cal- Caldwell. <laughs> Caldwell, there Caldwell. you go. I got it, man. How you doing, man? I'm good. Thanks for having me. Thanks for thanks for reaching out, man. And uh, so we were talking a little bit off air uh, before we started, and uh, you actually remember, I guess you remembered my name from years ago on another project I did, right? It's a whole decade ago, I think, at this point. <laughs> Stop it, man. You're making me feel old, bro. <laughs> <laughs> How do you think I feel? Yeah, I know, right? Exactly. So, yeah, you, you, uh, apparently you're one of the, the, the people who bought Broken back in the day. Well, I, I, did I buy it? I'm trying to remember. You I didn't bo- steal you it. Bo- you bootlegged sure, it. You bootlegged it. it. It's fine. You bootlegged it. It's fine. It's all good. Yeah. No, I mean, I saw it. I think because it was available at some point. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, no, I remember, you know, it was, it was kind of one of those things when, you know, the DBX 100A was coming out, the Canon XL2 was coming out, and everyone was like 24P was the huge thing. But like people hadn't really used it to make, you know, in generous terms, a decent looking movie, right. <laughs> you know, something really cinematic. And so I think your guys, I just remember you guys blowing up and sort of, you know, reading about it and reading about it's like the, the process behind it. And you guys had the whole website with like, here's how we did the effects and here's how we did the color correction. And here's how we did all this. And it was just like, you know, at, at that time, I mean, the people that are sort of into filmmaking now don't realize like how little information there was, yeah. you know, even 10 years ago. And so, um, you know, I mean, I've talked about that before, but this idea of like, you know, you and I, I don't know how old you are, but you and I are like products of... We're we're similar vintages. We're similar. We're in the same decade range, I guess. Um, But, you know, it's it's like how, how, even at the early stages of the internet, there still wasn't like a ton of info. And so you really had to like suss out, like, you know online like how people were doing things like i i've just i've said you know i'd be watching like the behind the scenes on magnolia back in like 2000 Mm -hmm. and seeing a dolly and being like a a fisher dolly and be like what is that thing like you know (laughs) mind blown Um, where where do you get one of those (laughs) yeah or or yeah exactly or like what is that for like i don't know what that's for you know or seeing a shot in a movie and trying to understand like you know, oh, is that a zoom or is that a dolly or is that a combo of both? Or like, how did they get all this walking stuff so smooth and you don't know what a steady cam is, you know? And then you discover, oh, there's a thing called a glide cam that you could use with your, your DVX or your GL2 or whatever you're using. And suddenly like, but you're sussing all this out. And I just remember like you guys like had put up, you'd taken this film, you'd made this film, you know, that was very well received, but then you had also gone that step further of putting up this like wealth of information in mm-hmm. terms of how you did it. And that just being very like a really cool thing in, in a, in a very, very small um, lake of film technique and information at that time. Thank you, brother. I appreciate it. Yeah. When I went, when I, when I did that movie, I, I, there was nothing. Like I, I looked nothing, everywhere. Yeah. I looked everywhere and I was like, well, I don't think this is kids, uh, I, kids today's have it so easy. Oh, these know, kids, they don't these know. These kids, they can shoot on their iPhone. The iPhone's better quality than what that I, movie I know, was right? Shot on. Like but, people, people to this day, I made it. I did a short in college that I won an MTV Movie Award for called mm-hmm. "The Beautiful Lie." Mm-hmm. You know that was shot on the XL2, and people are like, "Oh, can I see it?" I'm like, "No." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's uh, no. It's, I don't even know if I can get it for you to see it because it was like sd and it's on a tape somewhere and you're just like i don't, don't worry about it just just let it go just let it go yeah <laughs> so man how'd you get into the, in the industry uh in the first place i so i started making movies um in high school 
And um, we just had a cool program where we had like Avid systems and digital cameras and we were able to like edit. And this is like 2001, you know, 2000, 2001 Mm -hmm. um, that we had this. And so I sort of just took advantage of it, something that I kind of found myself really loving. And, you know, I had grown up like you know, seeing movies with my dad and, and playing, you know, take seeing Batman and then coming back and playing Batman and getting the neighborhoods kid together and sort of play acting, you know, or building worlds with like Legos or Playmobil and sort of like creating, you know, narratives and stories and, and, and sort of acting that out, but not knowing what a director did or a writer did or a cinematographer or any of that. Unlike kids these days, you know, just know everything. <laughs> um, and so, you know, and then in high school, I discovered that they had this program and, It was sort of being able to do this program from a learning perspective, but then we had um, our ASB officers, associated student body officers, would make parody movies um, in order to uh, sort of like, you know, introduce the new homecoming theme or Mm -hmm. something like that. And I had a friend that did it. And so I started hanging out with him and sort of pitching ideas. And eventually I took over directing these things. And we did like, you know, we did a, a, um, a usual suspects rip off. And these weren't like parodies. Like sometimes sure, some sure, of them sure. were serious, right. you know, they weren't like all comedy, but I did like usual suspects, um, rip off. We did like a snatch heist movie. I did a soap opera. And then my big finale was we did a, an hour long star Wars movie. Oh, wow. So it was like really great because we had the tools available to, you know, talking about not having this info, like, you know, back in 2002, trying to figure out how to make lightsabers work and do lightsabers on screen in After Effects. It was like, you know, and then I did one way and then I discovered the way that you could actually do it where you could get it to flare out. And I was like, well, it's too late now to make it better. It (laughs) looks like now it looks like a little toothpick that you're swinging around. And so, (laughs) um, you know, but just trying to discover that and using like 3D Max and like, you know, getting free downloads of of spaceships that, that people had built in 3d max and then animating that, you know, and just all that kind of stuff. Um, but the idea was you always had, you know, you had a deadline and we showed these at school assemblies. So like you were somewhat censored, you couldn't do whatever you wanted, but you were able, you were expected to make 1300 kids happy, you know? And so it was like a really great sort of formative experience at a very young age to sort of know that we had a deadline we had no money and we had to find a way to make it work. And so that's that's where a lot of my kind of approach has was born out of. Which leads which leads us to, I guess, you, know, you did a handful of shorts, obviously, prior to your first feature, uh, right. which kind of got your, your feet wet and you learned a little bit of the tools. But uh, on your first feature, which you made for 6,000, if I read correctly? 6,000. Yeah, 6,000. Layover. Can you tell us a little bit about that first feature? Yeah, it was um, – you know, it's the story of a, of a young um, – French woman who is traveling from Paris to Singapore to visit her boyfriend. And she, um, is sort of expecting him to propose once she gets there. And she has a unexpected layover in Los Angeles. Her, her connecting flight is canceled until the following morning. And so she's stuck here, um, for 12 hours. She has a friend here, calls her up, they go out. And that sort of starts this night of sort of self-reflection and discovery and sort of consideration about, um, you know, sort of whether the life she's flying to is the life that she wants. And sort of in an interesting way, she's given a pause button for 12 hours to sort of just take a breather and think about it. And that's kind of what the show, you know, and it's a, and it's a traveling movie. We travel throughout the city of LA, you know, we're all over the city. Um, I'm assuming, and, and you paid for permits and everything, right? No, 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 not at all. <laughs> totally. We had, yeah, we had the trailers and all that stuff following. No, um, <laughs> no, it was a total gorilla. I mean, shot on the 5D, you know, everything was stolen. We didn't permit anything, but it was an attempt. And the 6,000 was just, that was the money we had. So we made it work, but we paid our actors, mm-hmm. you know, we had a small crew. Like we always get, we get, you know, online, if you read some of the articles on like no film school, you get a lot of people who've never made a movie before mm-hmm. writing back and being like, oh, you didn't make it for six grand or how'd you do this? And how'd you do this? And it's just like, you know, one, well, go make a movie yourself before you talk. But two, like <laughs> there, there are creative ways of doing it. And you just have to think about it. Like they would make assumptions that were clearly incorrect. Right. You know? I, I, yeah, uh, I hear it all the time. I hear it all, yeah. all the time. And people just always wanted to like, well, how did, how did Robert Rodriguez really make the movie for 7,000? I'm like, well, the movie he showed his agent was made for 7,000. The one that we right. saw was made for 1.2 million. 
Right. Yeah. <laughs> After we did everything. Exactly. And so, but you know, it's like, it's possible. It's oh, it possible is. nowadays, Absolutely. certainly. And it was just one of those things where, you know, we just did a very limited crew. It was four people the whole time and we didn't pay the crew, but they got credit and we shot on weekends. So nobody really cared if they didn't really want to do it. They didn't have to be there. Like it wasn't, you know, it wasn't this thing where we had 30 people standing around and we weren't paying them, lean, you know, it was lean. very, which yeah. is what you people usually do. And I have done on shorts, you know, where you're like, well, I don't have the money volunteer. And it's just like, oh, yeah. Oh, you know, so layover was uh, an attempt to sort of do um, an indie movie for very low budget. That was different than, what you were seeing made, which was limited characters and like limited locations, like one to three locations, but they, they would have the crew. Mm -hmm. And I just got to the point where I was like, well, the crew is not what's up on screen. The crew is not helping me put something up on screen. So yeah. having made these shorts and little things with the 5d where I was running around town for no money and trying to shoot stuff and expected to turn in high quality work, I was like, is this possible on a feature level? Could I make a feature this way? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and so I wrote a movie designed to be accomplished at that budget, you know, for no money. I, I brought everything I had, you know, spent 14 years learning as a do-it-yourself filmmaker to the table. You know, I brought my experience as a shooter to the table, um, you know, and and we really kind of went for it. And it, it turned out pretty well. I mean, you know, it's a French language movie. I don't speak French, but we decided to challenge ourselves in that way. Um, you know, and it was also coming in a time in my life where I was like, you know, I'd been writing features and trying to get features made and you kept going like oh, $300,000 for the type of movie I want to make. Probably not going to get it. I don't want to spend time like looking for money. Mm -hmm. And it just kind of got, kept boiling down to me going, all right, I'm about to turn 30. I want to shoot a feature. So what's the feature I can shoot? And if the feature I can shoot is layover for six grand, then that's the feature I'm going to make. And, you know, and it wasn't even a gamble because like the money was like a non-issue. Like it wasn't like, you know, oh, I have this French language indie drama with no stars and I'm spending a million dollars to do it. And I'm never going to make that money back. You know, it was really so low risk that we never felt ever that we were like, oh, we can't get this done or, or this isn't going to work or it's not going to be as good as it can be. I mean, we, you know, we shot on weekends. We had time mm -hmm. in between the shooting days to figure it out and think about it, which is a process I brought to um, you know, another film I did negative more recently, you know, but that had a, a significantly higher budget, but we still brought the same approach, um, which was all basically it was all in service of making of turning around the best movie that we could, which really involved getting the best performances that we could. And so everything about the film was shaped to give us the most time on set to get the best performances possible. And so we didn't we barely lit. We shot the 5D at like 32, 6400 ISO, you know, um, and that allowed us to basically spend like show up light in 30 minutes and spend eight hours shooting the mm -hmm. takes mm -hmm. and get us really, really, really great performances. Um, and so, you know, the thing that I say is like everybody's sort of always thinking about their first feature and worried about their first feature. And I'm like, well, it's just a feature. You know, like mm -hmm. it's going to be good or it's going to be bad. And the thing is, though, is nobody's going to give you a shot until you just do that first feature. And yep. really for me, like I made great shorts. I have a short that I'm like incredibly proud of called Dig. And I spent like 40 grand to make it. And it's a period <laughs> drama. And it's got Mark Margolis in it from Breaking Bad. And it's like really, really, really great. Nobody cares. No one cares, man. No, no one, one cares. cares. I, I got, I got I did the nothing same thing. off of it. I did the same thing. Nothing <laughs> off of it. And the second I make a, a $6,000 French language, no <laughs> <Drama>. stars, indie <laughs> drama. Yeah. I get offers for the next three years off the same film. Now, that, um, well, for, first of all, I want you to, um, I just want to say, man, preach on, brother, preach on. Because, <laughs> I mean, I can't explain to you how much, and, and the, the listeners know, I, this is, ex you've said pretty much verbatim about f at least three or four podcasts that I've talked about all those topics about backing into your budget. Uh, doing yep. something low for your first one so you can just experiment and don't put pressure on it. It's not going to be a home run out the park. You're not going to get a deal with Sun, you know, go to Sundance, get a deal. And it could be. It could. No, but, you could, you know, but that's a lottery ticket. It could, but don't worry about it. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's a, a lottery ticket. That's a there's very few people that can. That's that, that happens. That's so just happen do the you. best work you can, and that's all you can do within the, within the parameters that you have. And that's exactly yeah. what you did. So, what, what, um, what was the biggest thing you learned on shooting on lay, shooting layover? So the biggest thing I learned shooting layover is that audiences – so 
really, it's a very technical thing, but it's a technical thing that leads into everything else, which is that audiences do not care about the image insofar as the way that DPs care about the image. And what I mean by that is that as long as it looks decent, audiences do not care. If it, as long as the performances are great. If you have a beautiful looking movie and the performances suck because it took forever to get those beautiful shots, mm-hmm. the audiences will not care about your movie. They will not care. Performance and attachment to the story triumphs over everything else. And so was, in a way, that gives you a huge amount of freedom. And mm-hmm. I talk a lot about this now. Um, everything I these new cameras like Canon cameras specifically and using them at very high ISOs, which allows me to step into locations and not light and not spend time lighting shots and instead spend time getting performance because I've said this before on layover and a lot of people watch layover and they think it's very beautiful because I think it's a beautiful film because you know, you use the natural city lights in LA and you shoot at 6,400 ISO. It's going to look amazing. Mm -hmm. Um, but I never once had an audience member, watching layover say i really enjoyed your movie until i saw the shot with some noise in it and it ruined it for me (laughs) yet i have always had people say in some other projects i've done that'll remain nameless that you know we didn't we spent a lot of time lighting and we didn't have time for performance and it was not set up in a way to succeed performance wise people do not care about it because the performances aren't great when you have three takes you're not going to get great stuff Unless you're using, you know, unless you got freaking like huge A-list actors in it and they know what they're doing, right. you know, and even then. But it really is like a thing where where I took from layover something that I now applied to everything that I have control over, which is like we are not going to spend three hours lighting this shot or this scene. Like we're going to I'm going to I'm going to ask you to shoot above 3200 ISO, which most DPs don't want to do. Mm hmm. And I'm going to ask you to trust me that it's going to be okay because I've spent two years doing it and doing it with great effect. And so to me, what I took from that was everybody really loves the performances in layover. And that was because we were in a place where we could play and we could try things and we could do things differently and we could spend the time to get the good performances and get the story right Mm -hmm. rather than worrying about is this lit as perfectly as it needs to be. And guess what? At the end of the day, people still love the cinematography and layover. (laughs) <laughs> right. You know, it's not like, oh, it looks like shit and you can't, you know, clearly it, it, it looks terrible, but the performances are great. It's like it still looks beautiful. It's really about, you know, Mark Polish and I talk a lot of it about this now because he and I have been sort of uh, sort of in the same vein. M- Mike's, saying that, M- Mike's a friend of the show. Yes, I know Mike. He's yeah. awesome. Uh, Mark, his brother. Oh, Mark. Oh, you're talking Mark. Mark I know Michael. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, Michael's great, too. But uh, Mark and I have been talking and it's sort of the idea of like, you know, uh, framing is almost more important than lighting. And so in that respect, framing doesn't take time. Like framing is discovery. Framing is like, you know, yeah. so and especially if you're shooting for kind of like, even if you're shooting at a higher resolution, you can always reframe in post as well. Exactly. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And it gives you that freedom. And so like, you know, I took from layover this idea that, wow, like we can go out in the street and go out into these locations that we've never seen before with a minimal light kit or a non-existent light kit and shoot really, really great material that people aren't going to believe we got. And so that, that to me is what I've taken from it and really have pushed DPs I've worked with now and pushed myself as a DP, um, you know, to sort of really take that to the next level. And I think that that's what I'm most excited about. What I'm most excited about in terms of like camera technology is low light sensitivity, not resolution. Right. Absolutely. And the cameras now are getting, they're getting sick. It's really they're getting sick. They're, they're ridiculous. I mean, I, you know, parts of negative were shot on this, uh, this Canon ME 20, Mm-hmm. That shoots um, up to four million ISO, mm-hmm. and um, we didn't shoot at that because it's unusable. But mm-hmm. you know, we shot a big sequence in negative, which is the shootout sequence in the middle of the desert. We shot that on at twenty five thousand and a hundred thousand ISO, and you see the stars in the night sky, and we were able to light with like you know, I had two people up there with a small light kit, like you lighting huge swaths of desert mm-hmm. because those, these cameras are just so sensitive. And so it it gives you a lot of freedom to move fast, move quickly, work with a small crew, get a lot of material, spend a lot of time getting like great takes and great. You like I'd rather have 20 great takes I've got to choose from in the edit than Mm -hmm. one, you know. And so that's what it's about. It's really about 
how do I on an indie budget build in the chance, the opportunity to do sort of David Fincher, Michael Mann style takes, you know, not a hundred of them, but a lot. Oh, but you look know, at Michael. Man, but give look us at, freedom. But look what Michael Mann did. I mean, he he was one starting. He I think he was one of the first guys, him and Fincher, to use the Viper, because yeah. it was one of the first guy, with cameras to actually see at night, and you can actually yeah. see more than film could see, uh, with uh, Collateral. I mean, that movie. Yep. I think he went a little I, too far in Miami Vice, personally. But well, <laughs> it was a little. We'll, gra- we'll agree to disagree on that one. But it was, um, it was a little grainy. It was just a little grainy. That's all. yeah. But you know, my, I think what's. I mean, we can. This is a whole side conversation. But I, <laughs> what I what I like about Michael Mann is I think he's pushing. He's pushing form. He and is, the thing that's absolutely. funny to me about Michael Mann in terms of people's like a- expectations of him as a filmmaker because they know him from Heat and they know him like for this really great narrative stuff. I think like Michael at heart is an art. He's like an arty filmmaker. Mm-hmm. Like he's like so interested in the arty aspect of it. And you see it now in his movies because he's got the freedom to play with it. And like you're either going to like it or you're not. Mm-hmm. But like it's so much more about like feeling and mood and like that kind of stuff than it is about like a narrative thread. Like the narrative thread right. is almost like secondary in an interesting way. But right. but anyway, but back to, you know, yeah. So, I mean, you know, everybody's sort of talking about this like resolution game. And I'm like, well, you got to think about like how that hurts you because like shooting at high resolutions means you got to pay a lot of money for storage. Mm-hmm. It's a lot of like heavy workflow. You know, it's not something you can probably do on your home computer to, to you know, color at 8K. And so it, it creates a lot of situ- a lot of issues um, for you down the line that you're going to have to make sure you've got the money for in order to accomplish it. And it doesn't, 8K doesn't make your movie better. No. You know, but I think that low light sensitivity on cameras can make your movie better because what it can do is it can, it can simplify and, and, and limit the amount of time you need to spend lighting, which means you can now spend more of that time shooting. And that's, what's going to make you, your movie better is to give you more material to shoot, you know, and to have in the edit room than having one, two takes. Now there's other, there's, the second movie you made was uh, be somebody. How'd you get that off the ground? That was just a four hire thing, honestly. Oh, really? I mean, that came out of, yeah, that, that was something where they were looking for a director and, um, they hired, they, they had seen layover. They really liked layover. And I had also come off of doing a, a series called South beach, which was on Hulu. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, and so be somebody kind of came out. It was one of, it's one of those four higher things that kind of comes out of nowhere. Mm-hmm. And you're like, Oh, this is a really interesting story. Like, you know, I, I can see my sort of see myself doing this and, and, you know, it was something that was like an opportunity at the time. And, and so I went for it and I, I sort of was intrigued by the idea of, of sort of taking this notion of like Roman holiday and mm-hmm. sort of, you know, and updating it. And, but shooting it in a, like a way that really spoke to me, you know, and sort of was my approach to it as opposed to, um, you know, somebody else's. And so I, I – and I was also intrigued by getting into this like digital world, this kind of world of digital features and influencer movies and sort of seeing if that was something that, you know, would lend itself to my approach. Yeah. What, what effect did Matthew's uh, audience have on the financing of the film and also the selling of the film? I mean uh, financing was all of it. It was all him. You know, I mean, it was certainly like the the impact of having 20 million very rabid followers, you know, um, you know, so possibly buying into that movie was was them determining this is worth the risk. And then I I know for a fact on Paramount side, the reason why Paramount came in and, and agreed to, you know, license and release the movie was was an experiment as well to see like, oh, does, is this something real? This kid's got so many followers. Is it something we can translate into sales? I don't. Mm-hmm. I don't actually know the answer on whether how that worked out, mm-hmm. um, but I think it did. I think it did pretty well. Theatrical. Um, I mean, I'm sure they did pretty well on VOD and, and that. Yeah, I mean, we did like a limited ten week or ten day theatrical, you know, for like a week. Mm-hmm. Um, but now it's on Netflix, it's on iTunes, it's on Amazon, um, you know, and so it uh, it seemed to get you know i think that it i you know i've had people friends of mine watch and they're like it's it's like it's good i get it and i'm like you know but i think it's like kind of directed at a very specific audience um Mm -hmm. you know and um but again like to me it was this idea of of again trying to experiment and try things and it's like oh how does this look if i have more money you know but on at the same time like one of my issues with that movie was i was given 12 days to shoot you know, mm. like we shot that movie in 12 days and Jesus. I'm like, and I, I, yeah, I saw, from the trailer alone, you, you bounced around a lot. It wasn't like yeah, you just shot I mean, that in that your room. Bringing that approach, which is a, here's how we can sort of, uh, expand the scope a bit. Um, but it was one of those things where I just, uh, you know, now I feel like every, and, and, and your listeners got to know this, like, here's the thing, like 
you sp- as a director, we spend so little time actually directing. <laughs> um, you know, we're either editing or we're writing or we're pre-production, but like we spend very, very little time on set directing and having that experience. So the more that you can do it, the better off you're going to be. You know, I think about it like, okay, like I did, you know, Leo or negative was like a 38 day shoot. Um, you know, and be somebody was a 12 day shoot. And then I've just done sort of a, I just did a short film that was a three day shoot and I just did a pilot, which was a two day shoot. So like, what is that? You know, 55 days. Mm -hmm. So out of 365 days, I've spent 55 of them on set directing. And the rest. So prepping for those days. (laughs) Yeah. Or editing those days. Right. Yeah. But you're not, there's not a huge learning until you're on set trying to figure out how to capture all this, Mm -hmm. you know? So, so getting on set and having that experience and having to solve problems and figure things out is probably one of the best things you can do to learn how to do all this stuff. And that's why like, you know, making layover, I didn't do this at 22 before I had done anything else. I did it after 14 years of just like do it yourself filmmaking and trying to figure out and going, Oh, you know, this works, this doesn't like, you know, layover is possible because when I, when I, I had a job working as an exec for Anthony Zyker who created CSI, that was, I was involved in digital then. And I didn't know much about digital and YouTube and all this stuff, but like, clearly you have no money. So it's like, how do you shoot stuff for cheap in digital? And, and so all of that came out of an experience of all these things like, wow, you have cameras that can shoot in low light. You can go out on the street and capture stuff without having to like, you know, cause I knew from experience with the red that you can't really do that. Mm-hmm. And so all these things started to add up, but they all added up because I was out there doing it and testing and trying things and shooting narrative and seeing what worked and what didn't. Um, you know, and so now it really is like, you know, be somebody was like sort of going, okay, I don't understand how I have a far higher budget than I do on negative, And yet I'm only given 12 days and yet on negative, I can stretch it out to 38, you know? And then to me, I go, well, what's the better movie? Mm-hmm. You know, for me, it's negative. Um, you know, in a certain way, but I, I, I really, I think that that's because I created a production model that, you know, as I mentioned, gives me more time to get greater scope, you know, and better performances for less money. And so now the learning is, well, here's where the waste is. Here's how I can change this. Here's where you need it and where you don't need it, you know, and sort of starting to feel out, okay, now how do I take this low budget model of like me and two people shooting a movie and having it look really good? How do I apply this to things with bigger budgets? You know, how do I apply these things where I have unions? How do I apply these things where I have like, you know, whatever. And so it's become like, now I'm trying to experiment with, with the whole form of production, the whole model of production, because, you know, one of the things that I find kind of frustrating is this idea, what, what they, what they've done in sort of the low budget indie world is they've gone, well, let's take the same production model of a 10, 20, 40, hundred million dollar movie <laughs> right, and apply it down to, you know, a million dollar budget. And guess what you lose? You lose days. Mm-hmm. You know, obviously you lose crew. You don't have the same size crew in a hundred million dollar movie, but you, you cut down to like, you still have a lot of crew. You still have a lot of trucks. You still have a lot of trailers. You still have a lot of this, that, and the other thing. But what you, what you really lose is days. Mm-hmm. And that is not really cool with me. <laughs> right. Because you, it, that, that, that doesn't allow you to get the performances you need and to tell the story that you were trying to tell. Yeah. You know, I just had this, I just, you know, had this discussion with a, with the producer on something and, you know, I, I was given a bunch of reasons why one location was, was better than the other. And I said, all of your reasons are production related. They have nothing to do with creative. Mm-hmm. And so I'm taking a less creative location you know, to adjust for production rather than production adjusting for creative. And what I need is sort of the power to control both, Mm -hmm. which is where I'm trying to get to. Because when I can do that, then I can do stuff like negative where I have 38 days, you know. Yeah, that's a pretty pretty bulky indie film schedule, without question. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, listen, they weren't like 38 full 12-hour days, you know. Right. But the idea was to really not the, – the idea was we have so little money, so let's pretend we have none, mm-hmm. which means let's spread it out. Like, you know, I don't want to find myself rushing to try and get, you know, car mount stuff, you know, and do every car mount scene in one day, which is what they would do on any other movie. Mm-hmm. You know, instead, like, we'll just go up when we go up. So, like, you know, but I also was able to go and do, like, one of the – a couple of those days we're just going down and getting one shot. But that's the shot that helps expand the scope, mm-hmm. but it's the shot you cut in a normal production. 
Right, you know? because you don't have the time. It's very you don't smart. Have the time. It's it's extremely smart. A lot of the stuff that you're talking about is what I just went through with my first feature with Meg. Right. It's just like I had to just go out there and like, hey, let's just go do it and spread it out. And I had days. It was all about time, having as much time as I could with the actors and locate. Yeah, it's it's all. It's it's wonderful to hear somebody else talking about this besides myself. <laughs> yeah, I mean, listen, I a part of it too is just figuring out what works for you. That's true you too. Know, yeah, like, it's, it's what's, like, your, what's your flavor? What's your uh, your process? Yeah, there are some people that can deliver a movie in twelve days, three takes per scene. You know, with really really great stuff. That's not really me. Mm-hmm. You know, and so it's hard to go and say, well, I need a hundred days. But like, arguably, I probably need a hundred days and a hundred million dollars to really execute a lot of this stuff, like in the way that I would want to. Because it's like it's weird. It's like you either need so little money that you have none, and it's like you're just completely free. Or you need so much money that you can buy that freedom. We're all – at the end of the day, I think all directors are, are aiming towards the freedom that Kubrick had. Yeah. With a, complete, yeah. with a studio behind you and you can do whatever you want. And, but, but a lot of people don't understand about specifically about Kubrick is that you know, they hear about these long – because he, ha- he had some of the longest. He has actually the world record for the longest film schedule with Eyes Wide right. Shut. But the thing is he has like you know 10 people on crew. Yeah. That's it. He's like, I'm yeah. just going to just keep – why are you here? If you're not helping me anything, get out. Like, yeah. And that's how he got all those days. He was never yeah. – he was rarely over budget. That's the funny thing. They think of him as a recluse, but he wasn't. He was actually always on budget. I think he went a little bit over budget on Eyes Wide Shut, but generally speaking, he was always on budget and just did his thing. But yeah. I think we're all aiming there. That's, that's what yeah. I, I would like. <laughs> well, and, and, it's, and it's sort of – you know. It's, I mean, it's, it has to get there, you know, because like people just aren't giving you that money. Studios aren't giving you that money anymore, you know? And so, um, yeah, so it's an interesting thing that I've been flirting with, um, and trying out and sort of like taking jobs, like be somebody sort of allow me to sort of see how, okay, this is how this works. Mm -hmm. Here's how I'd change it. You know, here's how I would adjust this. And so, you know, you only have so much power in a four hire situation. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's hard, I'm sorry, go ahead. It's hard for people to sort of understand and trust it, you know, because you're saying, you need to kind of give me the money and let me go away and make this. And people don't want to do that unless you have a hell of a of, of a resume. And yeah, or you can just or you're just coming in. I mean, it, like if I come in with a project and I wrote the script and I'm directing it, and I'm going to produce it. Like mm-hmm. you know, I can kind of say, listen, I'll I'll take less than what you would normally give for this, but you need to like let me just go do my thing. Gotcha. And you gotta trust me. You gotta trust me that I'll yeah. get done. Uh, now yeah. with now with layover, which is interesting, you have a six thousand dollar movie. What did you? What was what came of it as far as your career, as far as festivals, as far as distribution? How that how did that hope? Because a lot of people listening can make a six thousand dollar film, so I'd love to hear the story of where that actually went to and what it actually did for you. Yeah, so we uh, finished it, and we were very fortunate. Um, both Travis, who is a longtime friend and writing partner of mine, like produced it, and we're both both from Seattle. Mm-hmm. So we have a friend at the Seattle International Film Festival who had sort of heard about us making the movie because we'd been tweeting about it and things like that. And he was like, listen, I'd love to see it when it's done. So we sent it to him. His name's um, – and uh, uh, sorry, his name's Brad up there. And he, mm-hmm. runs, uh, he runs the Catalyst program. And um, he, he watched it and really, really loved it. And you know, he'd seen a non-finished cut, um, but he really loved it and he wanted to program it. And we were, we were like, listen, like – I mean, when we made the movie, we had no illusions about like, oh, it's going to get us into, it's going to get into Sundance, you know, and we're going to like be, you know, it's uh, again, what you said, it's like this kind of huge thing that's going to blow you up. I was like, no, I'm like, but I do think it might be a festival movie because we're talking about it being like a French language thing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, but, um, so anyway, anyway, so they, they offered it to us, the premiere, uh, to pr- world premiere there, and we took it. We thought that like being a little bit of a bigger fish in a smaller pond would be good. Mm-hmm. Being in our hometown would be good in terms of like getting, you know, sellouts and things like that. Um, and we really loved the idea of premiering, you know, our first feature at the, uh, at the, our hometown festival. Mm-hmm. And so, um, so it went really well. We had two sold out shows. We were nominated for their, uh, five for she. Um, award there, which is like their, their sort of prestigious independent, um, award. And, um, we didn't win, but, um, it premiered there. And then I managed to get, uh, David Chen of slash film to come and see it because mm-hmm. he lives in Seattle. And, um, 
and I said, listen, I've got this, uh, you know, you don't know me, but I've got this film. I know you're going to the festival. I'd love to invite you and have you see it. And he came and, um, and tweeted out some very nice things about it and then interviewed me afterwards. And that was kind of the first notion of the idea of it being like us putting it out there that it was a $6,000 movie. Mm -hmm. Um, and people started to not believe it, you know? And, and so we started writing articles and we did a whole, like, you know, we had a couple articles come out about like the, the sort of process. We had something on no film school and that sort of got us a little bit of attention. And then we got the usual like aggregators saying, Hey, we'll put your money in your movie up and you know, not pay anything. Mm -hmm. And we were like, well, let's wait and see. And so, so actually David ended up coming on board as a producer. He ended up helping sort of provide some finishing funds for the film mm -hmm. um, and promoting it and, and sort of getting it out there. And we basically went through a couple more film festivals, not a lot, you know, kind of once you give away your world premiere, like, you mm -hmm. know, unless you're a huge movie, people aren't really going to play it. Although some people, some people will, it's hard to know. Mm -hmm. I thought it was going to play in more festivals than it did. Mm -hmm. um, and we started aiming for a fall 2014. And so this was May of 2014. So then we decided to start aiming for a fall 2014 self-release we decided you know oh let's not do this aggregation thing because we're never going to make a dime off of it mm -hmm. and let's experiment again like the nature of the film is to try things and experiment so let's experiment with self distribution and try that out and see if it's possible um and so david was also very intrigued by that and so we ended up setting up our film on um gum road mm -hmm. um because they were like one of the cheaper like they took less in terms mm -hmm. of their their costs mm -hmm. And built a website and put it up and um, and started selling it and put it up on Vimeo and you know David David posted a couple articles about it and um, and then as a result of that we ended up getting a guy out of Canada who agreed to sort of do additional distribution and he ended up you know he put it on iTunes Amazon that kind of thing and we kind of reached a point where we were like hitting our limit in terms of sales so we were like yeah if somebody else wants to fund the cost of putting it up like we feel like we've kind of made our money. Um, but it would be beneficial just to get it out there. Was it a prof you know, was it a was it profitable at that point? Uh, no. Well, it might have at this point, but it's it has not made. It's made probably last I checked, it's made about five of its six thousand dollar budget. Okay. Um, but here's the thing. Like, here's what we learned from that. Right. Like, we have no stars in it. You know, um, we have it's a it's a very French. You know, it's French language. It's indie drama. And we kind of recognized, oh, like there's a limit to the sort of circle of discussion about that extends out of you, right? There's a limit to your reach. And we right. kind of realized, okay, like there's a limit to this reach. And it just never, it never really took off um, in terms of the public, you know, sort of consumption of it. Mm -hmm. But we were kind of always okay with that because we had made a feature and like we had made a feature that played in a felt a really reputable film festival it was getting attention and we were writing about it and people were intrigued by the $6,000 thing. And I started getting meetings off of it. And then I got, a, I got, you know, basically ended up getting the last three jobs I've had, um, came out of directly out of layover. Really? So that was just because did someone did, did, did people in the industry reach out to you? Yeah, I mean, they just had heard about it or saw it or my manager was pitching me, you know, um, or sending it out to people. I mean, listen, like the thing about Hollywood is while everyone's making Transformers movies, everyone came out to Hollywood to make The Godfather, you know, right. well, for the, mo for the most part. But creative execs really like, you know, they love a lot of different stuff and they're always looking for different things. And so the sort of idea of this low budget French language film made by a director that doesn't speak French became very intriguing and a movie on top of that, you know, they were, they were like kind of always amazed at what I could do for the budget. That's sort of become the thing that I'm trying to now get out of. But it <laughs> right. was always like, oh, that's the cheap guy. He could do the, yeah, the that's money. The cheap guy. He can do, um, <laughs> But I, but it was more than that because I think like they've seen obviously a lot of cheap movies and I think that it was really sort of just the, the right, it just works. I think the movie just ends up working. Got it. Now what's, but it was, but it, that's the thing that I, that I also talk about is like, listen, like if you want to go out and hunt down, you know, $4 million to make your first feature, like by all means, like go ahead, you'll probably do well off of it, mm -hmm. but like you can still do well. I mean, you need, you should have your man, you should have an agent, you should have a manager. They got to be able to, you, somebody has got to be able to push you, but like, it's possible to to create a career out of doing something for, for $6,000 that isn't some massive Sundance hit, you know, like clerks or something like that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now what, what's your approach when, when you are working with actors? You know, um, at this point it's, 
<laughs> it's hire the best actors that I can and kind of stay out of their way. Um, you know, which sounds really simple, but, but what I do, what I do is I, I mean, what I try to do is get it, get it into the text of the script. Like if it's not in the script, it's not going to be on screen. So like get into the text of the script. And then what I do is I high, I try to get the best actors that I can, whether those are friends or whether they're whatever. And if I, in it, and what I try to do is also adjust the role to their sensibilities. So I don't ask the actors to do, if they're not capable of doing big emotional crying scenes, I don't ask them to do big emotional crying scenes. You know, it really is about creating, like limiting the role to what they do best, because if they do that and do it really well, no one's going to miss. It, right. The biggest trick to movies is people don't miss what's not in a movie. <laughs> right. You know, if you don't, but what they do sort of, what they'll cringe at or what they'll scoff at or what they'll roll their eyes at are the things that you put in the movie that you really couldn't afford to do well. Mm -hmm. Right? Like don't do a car chase. If you can't really do a car chase, do a foot chase. Cause if you do a car chase and do it poorly, people are going to see that. But if you do a foot chase and do it really well, people aren't going to go, Oh, that was probably a car chase that they switched. <laughs> right. You know, <laughs> no, they're going to say um, that's a cool. So yeah. it's sort of, yeah. it, you know, so it's same thing with actors. Like, you know, you have to understand the sort of – until you're in a place where you can hire whoever you want and they're all very, very talented, you have to understand sort of those limitations. But if you can craft – if you can create those limitations in the character, then the actor can do what they do best. Mm -hmm. And you're not asking them to do something that they don't do um, very well. And so I sort of figure that out. We tailor the role to them. And then we sit down and we do a lot of talking. We do a lot of talking about the character and throughout the script and this is where she's coming from and this is who she is. And then if I can do any kind of like sort of real life training, like when we were with Katya on negative, she plays a spy. So we did a lot of like, um, you know, real steel gun training. Um, we did a lot of like, you know, I have a, a guy that's who's a former British SAS officer who does like conceal and carry training. And so we did a lot of like on the range gun training with her. Um, you know, we did like um, – so sort of some airsoft style training as well with mm -hmm. like, you know, former, former army Rangers and things like that. Um, so you're not using real steel, but it's still like you're holding a fairly realistic weapon and you're doing, you know, cl room clearance and all this stuff. Because like what I didn't want her to do on set was think about how she was holding the gun. Right. What I wanted her to do was behave and just the gun was second nature. And so like, so we do training in that way if we can. And then, um, and then really once we get to set, it's about, we've done all that work. We've done all the work of the character. And then it's about just fine tuning, right? Like, Oh, try this line. You need to be a little angrier here. You need, but it's usually like not a lot of talking to actors. It's not a lot of discussion on set. It's not a lot of like, here's your motivation, which is like the cliche. Mm -hmm. It really is like just fine tuning what they already know. And then, but also setting up an environment where you're not limiting them, right? right? Like you're not saying you got to hit this mark because if you don't, then you don't, you're not in the light and the shot is screwed up. You're trying to get them out of thinking about the movie aspect and more thinking purely from a character basis. So I set up a, the set and the way we shoot, I do a lot of handheld. I adjust to them, you know, so if they aren't on their mark, I'll move. Like I do a lot of these kind of things where what I try to do is like create the behavior and the blocking of what they're doing. And then I shoot around them. I, re I try to avoid asking them to adjust for camera and I try to adjust the camera for them. It's not always the case, but like for the most part, I, I like to do takes where it's a lot of discovery and they're doing what they do and I'm just capturing it. And then we go in and sort of like, you know, scalpel certain things where I'm like, I just need this angle in this position or I need this. And then we, but they've already done the bulk of it, you know? And so and and letting them letting them do their thing, like try not to get in the way too much. It's uh, it's kind of like what I say is, uh, you're there to capture the lightning. Yeah, yeah. In, in a lot of ways, and, and that just has come from me developing that approach over over the years of doing a lot of prep. So I know the character, they know the character. It's all in the prep. But like the idea of like you know, oh here's some action verbs, or oh like pretend there's a stone in your shoe, or like oh try and get her to smile. Like I don't really do any of that. Like I, 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 I'm not really, it doesn't really work for me. And, and I prefer trying to, what I try to do is just get to as realistic a situation on set as possible. And then hiring actors who are close to the characters that they can play. Like you say, their limitations are the limitations of the act of, of the character in a lot of ways. And yeah. The, and that's, that's really, if you're working with,
they haven't been on shows. They don't have as much experience. They don't have as much like, you know, talent because a lot of times you're starting out, you don't have, you know, unless you're in LA and you just know a bunch of actors, like a lot of times you don't have like, you know, access in the same way that you do, you know, as you build yourself up and you do more. And so, and so in that way you kind of want to limit it. But once you also get to a point where like the actors, it's their job. It's Meryl. Yeah. yeah, Meryl Streep's going to come in and do what she does. Yeah, like you're not you're not directing Meryl Streep. You're just kind of like you hire Meryl Streep and then you let her do her thing, you know. Um, So it's 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 sort of that prospect. And I think it's trying to create, you know, um, you know, and this is something that I've now it's like kind of also on set. It's like doing a lot of like real environments. Like, again, like even for negative, we didn't permit most of negative. We kind of just stole it. But we so, stole so, these so, kind of live environments. So, so tell us a little bit about – first of all, tell us a little bit about negative and then also the concept of stealing a shot because I know a lot of people don't understand what that might mean. So if you can explain the concept of stealing the shot and what are some of those tricks that you don't get caught. Right. So, uh, so I'll start with negative. So negative is the story of um, – Basically, it's the story of this guy. His name's Hollis, who's a um, he's like an amateur, slightly professional photographer, a bit of a hipster. And he's out one day taking photos and he snaps a photo of this woman. And next thing you know, he's back at his place developing the 35 millimeter film. And there's a knock on his door and she shows up and she demands the negative, demands the photo. And before she takes it by force, but before she can leave, men with guns show up. And so she uh, escapes with him, gets him to come with her. Um, and they have to essentially escape out of L.A. You come to find out that she's a former British spy who was trying to negotiate a retirement deal with a cartel when things went wrong, and now they want her dead. And because of his involvement with taking her photo and whatever, um, he's involved as well. And so they basically have to escape from L.A. to Phoenix to meet up with a former contact of hers and figure out what the next steps are. And so it's a bit of a spy movie, bit of a bit of a road movie. Um, it's a thriller. It's um, it's a lot of fun. It's really, really, it's it's cool. It was written by Adam Gaines, who's like this fantastic writer with really, really great ear for dialogue, and mm-hmm. Katya Winter from and Simon Quarterman from Westworld, isn't it? And, and, and Katya is from where? Katya's from. She was in Sleepy Hollow. Oh, very cool. And she's also been on Dexter. Uh Um, and so she's been, she's been around, she's done a few things. Um, and so Mar Vista financed it and produced it, um, Mm -hmm. along with myself and, uh, Will Borthwick, who was my producer on it. And it was one of the, you know, I, I DP'd it and it was one of these things where what I wanted to do was I wanted, I wanted Mar Vista to give me money and leave me alone and go, I'm going to go make this movie the way that I wanted to make it. So that's what we did. We basically, like I said, we shot for 38 days over the course of six months. Um, you know, we have gunfights in it. We have a really awesome fight scene. You know, we have a lot of travel. We go from LA to LA to Phoenix. You know, we did a road trip to shoot a bunch of stuff on the road. Um, you know, we shot a bunch of stuff up in the desert. Um, you know, and I was as a DP was in addition to being a director and the camera operator was basically trying to collapse the conversation. Cause I was like, I think that I need to try and do this my way in terms of like the visuals and see if I can take the layover approach and apply it to a, something with a bigger canvas mm-hmm. and see if that can work. And I think it absolutely worked. So, um, it was a really, really great thing. And we're just now in the process of searching for film festivals, like somewhere where we can premiere it. And then, um, you know, and then we'll, we'll Mar Vista will put it out and, um, and release it probably sometime next year. Now, that's really interesting about Mar Vista because, uh, you know, this movie doesn't sound like, um, generally when a distributor or, or a company, a production company like Mar Vista or, or that caliber, they're generally looking for some sort of star power that's going to be able to sell overseas and things like that, which what you're telling me basically goes against convention, uh, in a lot of ways. Well, Cause it's not a genre yeah. movie and, and either it's not a horror movie. It's not. You know, yeah. you know, unless there's a lot of nudity in it, which I don't, I don't know if I don't think there is. Um, no, I'm, I'm thinking. I mean, I'm, I'm now I'm, I got my my dirty AFM hat on, um, right? <laughs> which is unfortunate. Well, yeah, I, I'm just curious about how that came to be. Yeah, well, I mean, Mar Vista had been a fan since Layover, mm-hmm. um, and you know, their 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 thing is they do sort of their lifetime. You know, they make a lot of money doing those kind of movies, but they've started really looking for under a million dollar grittier film festival style movies right Mm -hmm. um like things that are very much against what they've been doing that like might you know play festivals and win some awards and get some attention in a different way but make them low enough low budget enough 
that they're not taking huge risks. You know, mm-hmm. it's not like huge, a huge gamble for them. And I think they were kind of intrigued. I mean, they really liked the script. They liked the package. I was about to make it no matter what. I was mm-hmm. about to maybe even self-fund it. Mm-hmm. Um, and Mar Vista came in and, and they were really intrigued by not only sort of every the package, but also just, um, you know, how much we were going to make it for, which I can't talk about, unfortunately, mm-hmm. um, but also the way in which we were going to make it. And I think that there was like, the idea was, Give us enough money to make this, but not so much that you really care. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, and then let us go make it and let us bring it back to you. And, and, and it was really me also talking to them and saying, listen, like, I need to make this my way. Like, I just come off doing a project that, like, I was not happy with because I didn't have control over it. And I just I need creative control, you know, not Final Cut, but I need I need creative control to execute this the way that I want to execute it. And they were very, very generous and in allowing me to go do that and very supportive of that process. Um, so, you know, I think that they have a sense of what they can make off of it and they know that whatever they gave us budget wise is much less than <laughs> what they than can that. make. Obvi- so, obviously. So um, that's how that works. Uh, yeah. No, as so far I think they're, they're stoked on it though. They really like it. Now, as far as stealing shots, can you talk a little bit about tricks, tricks that yeah. you've learned along the way on how to steal shots, what to do and what is stealing a shot specifically? Well, you know, listen, um, you know, when I talk about stealing a shot, I'm not talking about stealing a shot with a bunch of trucks and gear and equipment and crew and all this stuff, right? Like if you're going that route, you need a permit, like, because that's what police care about. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that's become really interesting with this whole YouTube thing and iPhones and all this stuff is the, the, the really proliferation of people shooting stuff, right? People are shooting stuff, especially in LA all over the place. And it would be a police officer's full-time job to sort of police that. So they don't really care. As long as you're not blocking sidewalks, as long as you're not impacting pedestrians, as long as you're not, you know, sort of like creating a headache for traffic or, or doing anything dangerous, they're not really going to pay attention to you, especially if you're a limited crew. If you're like under three people, they don't really care either. So that gets you around sort of the law thing, the permit thing. And again, like check with your lawyers, do your due diligence, like don't take my word for it. But this is in my experience because a permit only gives you really permission for that moment when an officer shows up and says, do you have permission to be shooting here? Mm -hmm. You know, that's it. It's not something you need for distribution. It's not something you have to prove later. Like it's literally just a document that's good for like the day that it's, you know, it's dated. Mm -hmm. Um, And so, you know, that gives you a lot of opportunity to sort of steal stuff. Now, you know, stealing a shot basically means not paying money for it um, and not permitting it. Mm-hmm. Um, and so there's, you know, a lot of sort of looseness in that. But really, it's just it's getting the shots without people sort of stopping you. And, and the fact is, I've never really been stopped mm-hmm. um, because I move so fast. So like one of the things about like layover is layover, again, opens on an airplane flying above Los Angeles. We're on a real plane. And we land at LAX and we walk through the airport and we get on a shuttle and we go to a hotel and all that's in the movie. None of it is permitted. None of it was paid for. Well, the, you, we paid you for the actually shot, you shot in the airport. Yeah. How did you shoot in the airport? You well, just walked in? so we just walked through and we got one take and you know, I had a five D kind of like pressed against my chest right mm-hmm. behind my actress. And mm-hmm. we sort of just walked and I shot it all documentary style knowing that I would cut it up later. And that's the secret. Like you can't do it where you have multiple takes and important performances and certain lines you got to nail and you can't do any of that. If you're stealing a shot, you need to kind of steal a shot like that, that, that you can shoot kind of doc style. So that might not fit into like somebody's style of shooting. It mm-hmm. works in mine. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, we shot in union station, you know, but we do all these as like kind of walkthroughs. So they like, they show up as like seconds, you know, they show up as like, these short things, these interludes, these in-betweens, um, you know, and we, and we basically, um, you know, but that gives so much scope to it. That gives such My a God, big shoot, yeah, If it. you're shooting at Union Station, I mean, I guess if you walk in with a small enough camera and you're yeah. not making a big deal of it, and you're just shooting with natural light and you're just and, following and, somebody or getting someone yeah, sitting down. Yeah, you're just walking through, like they don't even know to stop you. They're not looking for that. Right. You know, they're looking for like shoulder cameras and like whatever. And so, you know, I shot negative with the C100 mm-hmm. Mark II, um, and, you know, which is a fairly small compact camera. And so, like, by keeping it sort of close to my chest and, like, having the monitor where I could kind of just look down and see it mm-hmm. and just walking, like, I chose a style that benefited from that approach. 
you know, and that's or also, and, choose and, one. It's like it is my style. And that's it is a compact camera, but it's definitely not a DSLR camera. So it does no. have a little bit of a footprint to it. Yeah. So you got to be a little slick with that. Kind but of now, camera. yeah. But nowadays, these cameras they have autofocus. That's fantastic. Mm-hmm. You know, you can get away with like so much because these cameras are really small. They're compact. They're light. It's just really like. It's 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 if you're stealing it like we shot a whole chase sequence through this Chinese market in Chinatown, mm-hmm. right? And the way we did it was just walking through it. Like we just walked through it. And I would I would like I'd stop and I go okay wait stop and then I get to the front shot and I do like a walking backwards thing for like 20 feet and then we turn around and do a side shot. Like we would just move through it and I knew that I was just going to chop it up so much and mm-hmm. nothing was the geography was not going to like be um, you know uh, not have a continuity to it so it didn't matter. And I could just like, you know, I could just cut. And so that's very different than going out and shooting a dialogue scene where, you know, you need to do multiple takes, multiple, you know, you're trying to get performance. You don't want anybody bothering you. And so for negative, what we did for a lot of those was we were out in the desert. We just went up to Palmdale and found yeah. like these tracts of land that, you know, I've shot on before and we would just go shoot and nobody bothered us because nobody cares. Yeah. Well, you know? I just went to uh, one of the scenes in my movie. I, I went to the Hollywood sign. And I was yeah. I was nervous because I'm like, oh, man. But halfway up, I figured out, I'm like, there's no one coming up here. I'm exhausted. No, no By the time someone calls somebody, it's over. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's, it's, it was pretty eye-opening, and it gave a yeah. lot of scope to the movie. Yeah. And again, people, I think in L.A., they kind of give you the benefit of the doubt. You mm-hmm. know, like they, they kind of assume, one, again, like YouTubers are shooting all the time. You know, yeah. <clears throat> with Layover, Layover was interesting because – the other thing about shooting with the DSLR is people don't assume you're shooting a movie. Right, right. You know, people's perception, this is what it really boils down to. People's perception, although it's changing, uh, but people's perception of making a movie uh, making a movie is not one guy with a small tiny camera. Right. You know, it's sound guys and lights and trucks and a lot of people and a big camera. And so that's what they assume making a movie is. I mean, when we were shooting in the airport, you know, we had people sort of being like, oh, like, what are you shooting? I thought I thought people were going to flag me thinking I was taking photos, mm-hmm. you know, like, but I was also not taking photos of like, you know, I didn't try to shoot the security area. Mm-hmm. Like, I wasn't an idiot. I just looked like it, like the actress I was with. Just we just look like travelers, mm-hmm. you know, so it was and just so you it and her. Like, it was just you and just her? me and just me and her. Yeah. Done. You know, we bought we bought two tickets to San Francisco and we went to the airport early and shot the end of the movie. And then we waited and we flew up to San Francisco. And when we flew back, we shot on the plane coming into L.A. And, you know, and then we shot on our way out. And yeah, like you just kind of like, you know, it just looked like we were taking photos. And so people just don't know and they don't they don't assume that you're like making a movie. They assume like, you know, our, our cover was going to be, you know, oh, well, we're, um you know, we're just like travel vloggers. And if people were like, well, you can't shoot, I'd be like, OK. Right. You know, yeah. like it wasn't like, I mean, we even tested it. We went, we went and did a test shoot and we went to like the baggage claim area at LAX and shot with the camera and shot a couple things and like nobody paid attention to us. Wow. Really? Yeah. Interesting. Well, that's great. Yeah. That's great. Great, great advice. Uh, I mean, but yeah, you know, and so, but there's only certain things you can do. Like, you know, I mean, I'm not going to attempt to do a scene where somebody's holding a gun in public. Like, yeah, that's, that's so, just, that's just foolish. Yeah, yeah. 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 It's just foolish. So it's like. So what it is, is it comes back to your script, right? It comes back to what you talked about, which is like, you know, uh, adjusting your script for the budget you have. And basically it's creating like a modular script. So like what you're doing is you're creating a script with scenes that can kind of be shot anywhere. And like, you know, like, you know, in Layover, and I reference Layover, Layover is easier because people can actually watch it, you know, Mm -hmm. but like Layover, there's a club scene. And I knew... I was never going to be able to afford to do a club scene because I've done music videos and I know mm-hmm. it's like it costs it's, so much it's, money. So it's got, ridiculous. It's ridiculous. So I was prepared. I was one. I was like, okay, I know people in the club scene. Maybe I can come in with them and bring a camera like I'm a photographer, mm-hmm. you know, like, and then we'll shoot the like scenes. Um, or maybe I'll buy a table for like, you know, part of the budget for three, 400 bucks and I'll bring my iPhone and we'll like just shoot on the iPhone. Right. But the whole premise of this in terms of how we execute it was all done because in the script, I was like, I'm never going to get like a club that I own Mm -hmm. to shoot this scene. So I need to write a scene that does that, that has limited action, no dialogue and does not require me to do repeat performances. Cause if I have to steal this in order to get the size of us being in a big club, Mm -hmm. like I can't afford to have people go like, why do you keep doing the same thing over and over and over again? You know? So I didn't. So I designed it to be kind of documentary. Like the point of the club scene in layover is her letting go. She's taking ecstasy. She's like letting go. She's having a fun night. 
And that's what that scene really needs to reflect. And then there's a small bit of action. Now, we ended up getting permission to come into an, an existing club um, mm-hmm. that was open, and we were allowed to be in there for an hour with our cameras. So we were able to shoot a lot of that stuff. But mm-hmm. it was designed to be done um, in a way that did not require a lot of effort production wise. And that's part of it, right? Like just being smart about it. Like again, the, the airport, not shooting stuff that requires a narrative, not shooting. Like the narrative is she gets on, she flies into LAX, she gets off the plane, she walks to the airport, she gets on a shuttle, goes to the hotel. That's all you need to know. Uh, and I can roll a lot of it because all I'm looking for is a little piece that I can edit. Well, I mean, it's perfect. You're basically telling, you're basically saying the same thing that uh, Mark and Michael did, a Polish did on for lovers only. Yeah, they went exactly. over. They went over to France and shot in every cathedral, every place they wanted to, because they yeah. were shooting with a DSLR, and they happened to have a star in it with Dana uh, that helped to sell of it, the selling of it. But uh, yeah, but they on a production well, standpoint, that's what they did. Listen, like if we got kicked out of the church, then we'd shoot the scene in a cafe. Right. You know, you got <laughs> you got to be able to flow modular, with it. You know, you, yeah, yeah, you got to like, flow. Yeah, exactly. You got to be, you you know, so you design a script to be done like that. Like I always say, you know, don't write in, don't be specific about things. Like don't be specific about the house. It's just, it's a house. It could be a small house, a big house. It really doesn't matter because once you write in what, you know, a way in which it matters, then that there's only one way you can do that. You know, there's only one house that you can get and And that's that's going to cost you money. And that's money. You know, like, and if your uncle, by the way, has a Ferrari dealership and he's going to loan you a Ferrari, great. Write the Ferrari in. Awesome. You know, but yeah. don't write in a Ferrari knowing you can't get it without paying for it. it, it and so, exactly. yeah, that's the kind of thing. And also like, you know, and I, I, I ran into this on South Beach because, um, you know, I came into South Beach. South Beach was my first job after layover. And it was certainly a, a massively, not massive, but it was a much, much bigger budget than I had on layover. Mm-hmm. Although pretty much any budget is bigger than what I had on layover. <laughs> um, but, you know, it wasn't a lot. And so what I, I, you know, I sat down with them because they were like, well, these locations are costing more money than we expected, da, 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 da. And I said, listen, you guys have written a TV series or a Hulu series, but you've written a story that's entirely about rich people. Like everyone in this story is rich. <laughs> and so, <laughs> you know, and you and you've set up expectations for an audience, right? Like you've got Samantha, who's a club owner of the hottest club in in South Beach. You've got her dad who runs the hottest record exec record label in in Miami, right? These are people who require the look of success in your show or nobody's going to buy it. So suddenly you've got to find you can't give this high powered record record label owner a corner office in a basement. You right. know, you can't do it. You got to give them something with views. So you... that stuff, you know, you can't have 20 extras in a club. That's the hottest club in South beach. Mm-hmm. Like you, you need three, 400 people to fill this thing, mm-hmm. you know? So I'm like, that's, that, that's your problem. The problem isn't like it's costing you money. The problem is you wrote a, you wrote a script that's cost you money. You know, there's only so much I can fake. You right. know, I can fake nice clothes. You know, I can't fake three hundred people club. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's only you know, so much because, computers can do. <laughs> yeah, and so yeah, exactly. So, but that's the thing is like you know, don't write scripts about rich people. <laughs> you right. know, like you're not gonna be you're not gonna be able to afford just to fund the creative that's required to make them look the part, and then you're in that whole like you know, middle school thing where like you're playing, you know, you're you're shooting your brothers playing gangsters and cops, and they're twelve years old. You know, that's, that's where you get into. And so any, like the thing for me is that I'm, I I've said this before and like, I'm really allergic to cheapness as a director. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like I, I, I don't, I will make any adjustment I can to make it not feel cheap because if you feels cheap, your audience is just going to sense that too. And they're going to turn off because it's again, going back to like the chase scene, right? Like fast fast the fast series has cornered the market on chase scenes like so unless your chase scene is so outstanding and so different and so unique and achievable with whatever money you have why are you bothering don't bother because yeah. everybody's going to compare it to that right you know and so find a way to be different because trust me like i've had the experience on stuff i produced and stuff i've been involved with not as a director fortunately but on other things where You write a chase sequence and it just gets cut and cut and cut. And all of a sudden you're in a loop de loop, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, in a warehouse that is not very exciting, 
you know, and everybody sees, wow, that was a really rinky dink chase sequence that clearly they had no money. I never want people to say, wow, you clearly had no money. I will do everything I can to, to, to not put in the idea in their, into my audience's heads that I had no money to pull off what I wanted to pull off. I would, I hate this idea of let's take a million dollars and make it look like 20 (laughs) million. Right. Like take a million dollars and make it look like, you know, like don't reach for a $20 million thing. Do the million dollar version really, really, really well. Mm -hmm. You know, like do an outstanding foot chase, do an outstanding fight scene, like, because you can afford those things, but you can't afford, you know, to blow up an airplane you know, as a car flies out of it, like you're going to do that visually on your own home computer. It's going to look like crap. And that was a, the, the funny thing is um, on Swingers, uh, Doug Lyman actually said, you know, instead of us trying to make the million dollar movie, which I think they had like, I think half a million bucks or something like that to make that movie or 300,000, yeah. something like that. Instead of trying to make the $300,000 we've got look like a million or two. Let's make the $300,000 movie look like a $20,000 movie, but let's just blow open the scope. And yeah. that's what they did. And yeah. it worked perfect because you look at that movie, you don't go, oh, that looks like a three, four, five million dollar movie. No, it looks like what it is. But they were able to travel to Las Vegas and yeah. do all this stuff. That They're all over the place. Yeah, with, they would have never been able to do if they were trying to blow, push that production value up to a $30 yeah. million. Dollar, that's, whatever. that's what we did on Layover. You know, Layover is nighttime. It's all shot at night. We're on motorcycles. We're traveling through the city. It's shot on a 5D. It's not like, you know, it's almost entirely handheld. You know, like the lights are sort of blown out. That's not like perfectly lit, like, you know, but there's a beauty to it and there's an experience to it. And what I've kind of gotten to where I've gotten to that I'm very a, a place where I'm very, very excited about is this idea of like you are following along on this. Mm-hmm. You're not you don't feel like it's staged. You. That's the inter- that's the feeling that I now as a director am interested in, in trying to get on film and trying to create for my for for the audience is this idea of like is this real mm-hmm. like because it feels like this is a documentary so, but I know it's not I got you so I got three last questions I, I ask all of my uh, all of my guests cool. um, what is the advice you would give a, a filmmaker just starting out in the business uh, get yourself a camera. Whatever that camera is, don't worry about how good it is and, and, and find and start shooting. And, uh, you know, some of the best advice that I saw was funny enough on, and you might have been on this, not this thread, but like mm-hmm. on the board. But remember the IMDb like message boards? Of course. Like with all the like filmmakers and there were some like a couple guys on there that were clearly like hot shots and they mm-hmm. were like, you know, making like some direct to DVD movie. <laughs> um, <laughs> right. But, but the best thing that I saw, uh, was, Get yourself a camera, find some plays, short plays, Edward Albee, the zoo, whatever, mm-hmm. get a, two people, to, you know, get a couple people together and start shooting and, and, and get some editing software and try to put it together and learn from that and see how you messed up and see what doesn't work and see how you cross the line. But really, like, I think that you can read about it, you can study up on it, you can do it, but you got to get out and you got to do it. You got to see what works for you. So, like, I I really don't think there's a substitute for, like, doing it. And nowadays, you know, if it's an iPhone, if it's using that, like, you know, what's that, the, the, it shoot like 2K or 4K on the iPhone that they shot, they shot, um, Tangerine. Tangerine on, yeah. Like, whatever it is, you know, like, there's, there's, you don't really have an excuse anymore. Mm -hmm. And don't, worry what's going to happen with it it doesn't matter yes now right now your goal is to just make things put them together see how it works see what didn't and then make it again don't be precious don't be exactly precious. don't be precious there's so, plenty of time to be precious later you gotta uh, earn you gotta earn it you gotta earn yeah exactly as opposed to i know so many filmmakers that make their first feature and they and they are on it for three years yeah and just on it for three as opposed to just keep going keep going keep going they're just on yeah. it for three years um what's the lesson that took you the longest to learn whether in the film business or in life Um, okay. I don't have one that took me the longest to learn, but Mm -hmm. it's something that it takes people a long time to learn. Mm -hmm. Um, and that is nobody's going to do it for you. Yeah. So I learned very quickly after I won my MTV movie award and nobody saw the awards and nobody cared Mm -hmm. that I was not God's gift to filmmaking and not (laughs) the second coming of Paul Thomas Anderson. Um, (laughs) right. 
you know, I won this award and really thought like, oh, the doors are open. You know, I know it's an MTV movie award, but like who win, you know, who's a student filmmaker that wins an MTV movie award. Right. right. Um, and that, it just didn't happen that way. Right. And the doors didn't open and I didn't, you know, get agents calling me and I wasn't making my first feature at 23. Um, it took me a, a couple of years to really, you know, go, OK, nobody's going to do this for me. So if I'm going to make it happen, I've got to start hustling. And mm-hmm. that's one of the best lessons that I've learned. And I was fortunate that I actually learned it early on rather than. 10 years of sort of bitterness waiting for people to read my scripts and give me a shot, even though I hadn't really earned the right to do that. I, uh, I'm that bitter guy. <laughs> <laughs> it took me a little longer to figure that out. My friend. Well, well, there's a lesson for you. You can take that. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, no, it's the truth. The I, I was waiting around. It, it, I was waiting around. I wasn't waiting around for people to do stuff, but I was like, I wrote scripts, try to get the money. Yeah, I man. Shot a short, tr- short, shot a short, that short's going to blow me up. Because, you know, when I did Broken, Broken did open a lot of doors for me. Um, right. You know, I got de- – I didn't get deals, but I got a lot of meetings, a lot of stuff. But I didn't have anything ready. I had no script. I had no nothing. And I lived, yeah. I lived in the East Coast at the time. So it was like right. – it was really a waste. All that attention it's, was a waste. It's so easy when you ha- – because I, I feel the same way. It's so easy at a younger age when you have something like that happen, right? Like all these people want to meet with me or, oh, I won this award. Like unless it's literally like an Oscar. Or like Sundance. Even then, even then, even then, and even, even then. then. Yeah. But um, but at least you could say you won Sundance or an, or an Oscar. Yeah. But you know, it's 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 that thing of of um, it's all just like it's all talk. It's just all talk. Even now, I'm just like I'm telling my agents, I'm just like I, I we got to stop it with the generals because like they're a waste of time for me. Like I'm I'm tired of these. Like let's go in when I have something, but like. To sit to say like oh this is mine. Oh, like, like let them watch general my stuff meetings, and let's go yeah let me yeah, general meetings but, like hey I just want to come over there and like have meet and greet right because the idea is it it's it feels like something's happening when nothing is happening that's what this, this and, that's what this town is built on <laughs> yeah and it's distorting and you can get really lost in it and you can be waiting around saying oh they just they're gonna read my script and then and the fact is your script's probably not that great you know and like you know you got to create opportunities for yourself like that's what it really is like we're in an age where you know, whatever system was in place in the nineties where like filmmakers could come out of Sundance and like blow up and do big, big features. Um, you know, it's not that anymore. Like people are looking at YouTube and there's also no excuse now. Like you have such an opportunity with like the, the, the cheapness of shooting, editing, sound, um, equipment. But not only that, now you have distribution. That's Mm -hmm. what's really cool and different about this world. You know, whether it's indie film, whether it's YouTube, whether it's whatever is like, I mean, for 2000 bucks, you can pay to have your movie on iTunes, Amazon, Vudu, like whatever, any of those, you can pay upfront to make that happen. Yeah. Yeah. You use something like, yeah, like distributor or something like that. And so that was never available before you were making a movie and spending whatever money you were spending, hoping that somebody else would do it. Now that's not the case. And the fact is like, you know, Yes, there's so many people now on YouTube and it's like saturated and it's like a saturated market. But like I think that what I've seen is like good content still breaks through. Mm -hmm. And if you have somebody, if you can get somebody like an agent or a manager that can help push through into the Hollywood area. Because listen, people in Hollywood are not watching YouTube all day. Mm -hmm. They're being told who's on YouTube and earning a lot of money, Mm -hmm. you know, and then they watch them. And so, you know, um, and also like think about this too. Like a lot of people make movies like – you know, for fans, like, or for an audience, maybe your first couple of movies should be made for the industry, right? Mm-hmm. Like what movies would an industry like an exec like to watch? What would mm-hmm. he enjoy? Because then he goes, oh, I really like this guy. Let's get him to make this movie. Mm-hmm. You know, that's yeah. what happened with layover layover. Didn't find a massive audience in terms of the public because what America, you know, it's America and who's watching you know, any movie with subtitles. That's but, a, that's what I find so fascinating about lay- layovers because it's so not El Mariachi. It's, it's so as far away cl- from it as you can or guess. Clerks or or any yeah. of those kind of movies. It's a foreign film shot in L.A. by a non foreign director. Yeah, it, it, it's like if someone would tell me like this is going to be my first feature and I'm, I think I'm going to be able to get work off this in L.A. I'll go, you're nuts. You're oh nuts. yeah, for sure. You're nuts. You're absolutely yeah. nuts. So, I never thought it was going to lead to what it led to, but it's this idea of like, like you said, the pitch sounds so intriguing. You're like, I got to watch this. And then it's at least good. If it were terrible, you'd be like, oh, forget it. But right. like it, it, people seem to really connect with it in some way. Cause it's about, you know, it goes back to like layover is about a choice. Layover is about coming to a fork in the road 
and trying to figure out which direction to take. And everybody has been in that position. Mm-hmm. Amen. <laughs> now, what are three of your favorite films of all time? All time is The Insider. Okay. By Michael Mann. Yep. Good film. S- second favorite film of all time is Traffic. Good film. And I would say my third favorite film of all time is Casablanca. Nice. I guess yeah. I always I always like I always find it fascinating to ask that question because it really gives me a a good idea of the sensibilities, especially when I'm talking to a director or a writer. Like yeah. their sensibilities in those three movies pretty much says a lot about your sensibilities. Cos- I mean, Casablanca is a huge outlier, but it's just such a perfect film. It is. It is. Like it's it just is. it's a, it's an unbelievably perfect film. It's one of those things that I just like I can put on any time and just enjoy it, and so and I can watch it as many times as possible. But, um, and Soderbergh, yeah. and Soderbergh, I mean, traffic is, is, is a genius. Work. Traffic blew my mind. I saw it like five times in the theater. Yeah. But also Soderbergh, is one of those directors that doesn't get as much credit as he should. Man has done no. some amazing out. I mean, out of sight. Yeah. Like, out of sight. Oh, I mean, even the, God. even the Che, you know, yeah, like, the che, yeah. uh, two For- movies, like his work on the Nick is unbelievable. It's mm-hmm. like, I mean, it's funny because I see myself, starting to go in that direction, like where I'm, I'm DPing and I'm operating and I'm yeah. editing and yeah. I'm like, you know, and I'm like, Oh, that's, that's kind of like the path he took and, and it seems to work out for him. But it's this idea of like, you just kind of get to a place where you're wanting to condense all these conversations, you know? You know, I feel, I mean, I just, I just DP'd my feature. I edited it. I was the camera op. I was a director. I did, I did yeah. pretty much everything on it. Uh, you know, almost everything. I had a three man crew on it. And, uh, you know, you're right. You're like, I don't want to have to, I, I couldn't have had all those people. It would just take too long. And we were able to shoot something in six, it, from idea to finish in six months. Yeah. There you go. And you're done and you're out the door. And it's all you, yeah. you know, for better or worse. Yeah. That was the thing on negative was I was like, listen, but for better or worse, this represents exactly what I want it to be. You know, whereas before it's sort of like, okay, it's sort of what I want. It's close. Like the DP is fantastic. I don't really have a complaint about it, but like, oh, I would have done this or we could have sped this up or been quicker on the lighting with this, mm-hmm. you know, and it's instead of just being like, yeah, I'm going to put one light up. I mean, I, you know, I know you're, I don't know what you are on time, but like this yeah, last project that I just did in, I just shot this project in Mexico city with Canon mm-hmm. and it's called see you dad. It's a short, it's a, it's a short, that's like a proof of concept for a feature. And the idea is, um, you know, we basically went down there and we, we caught, shot completely without permits and we shot in these, you know, it's a narrative documentary hybrid. So it's like there's narrative elements where we're doing dialogue and we're doing it French New Wave style where we're in controlled environments like mm-hmm. indoors, restaurants, you know, mm-hmm. uh, apartments, whatever. And then we have these kind of like on your street. There's a story of like a, a, a combat of a, of a, a photojournalist, mm-hmm. you know, who's like covering Mexico City. And so she's basically like. So we, we shot the narrative stuff like like Mark is actually in it. Mark Polish. She came down and, and oh, was cool. in it. Oh, cool. That's awesome. And so we actually like shot the, the documentary stuff. Like, I mean, the, the narrative stuff, these conversations in these locations that one I had never been to before. I had never seen. Mm-hmm. And we did it with basically existing artificial light. Like I put up like one or two lights at most in these scenes. Um, and I just shot it like on the Canon C300. You know, I shot at high ISOs. That was a whole part of it, which was like it was like a live learning exercise for like DPs and students down there to sort of see, no, you can push this camera beyond 3200. I know everyone tells you not to, but you can. And this is what it looks like. And this is what you get, you know. And so you're able to shoot like five page dialogue scenes in four hours because you're spending 20 minutes lighting. Um, mm-hmm. and then you go out in the street and you shoot all of this documentary. Like we were like basically like Nightcrawler, like we were patrolling around Mexico City trying to find like, you know action with like cops and things like that. Um, and it was like, it was really like life changing for me because I was able to really prove how you could shoot something cinematic without the use of like anything other than the camera. Um, and so it's created now this, this sort of approach that like I'm, I'm starting to blend into other things I'm doing, which is this kind of like feeling of documentary narrative hybrid. And the thing about the documentary and the thing about stealing shots and the thing about like that aspect of it is you don't know what you're going to get. Right. Like when Mm -hmm. we were shooting with her, we ran into a police raid with like cops and riot gear. We ran into a truck, a semi truck had crashed into a building and it like destroyed the entire front end of the cab. Mm -hmm. And then we happened upon um, a a fatal hit and run, 
where we showed up and like, I mean, they were like, like I have a shot in the movie of them moving the body from like the street to the corner, mm-hmm. like van. Mm-hmm. And it's just like, you could never plan that. And you can never do that without a huge amount of money to stage all that. Right. And yet it works within the narrative because it's about her being in Mexico city shooting this stuff. And so it's really, for me, it's like kind of the new thing, which is like this idea of like, so, like Soderbergh does this too. He doesn't light, you know, he builds the lighting into his sets mm-hmm. and he puts up one or two things and that's it. And he just moves, he just moves, 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 moves and shoots really quick and like, but gets a lot of material. And so that's kind of where I want to be, which is this idea of like, let me break open this traditional production model. Let me shoot things a different way. And then all you're doing in talking in terms of the money is expanding the scope of how that's captured. But the idea of blending reality, what is real and what is not, what is in this movie is real and what is it, um, and having documentary and narrative footage look exactly the same. Mm-hmm. There's no differentiation, uh, differentiating between them is is probably the, is the next sort of frontier of what I'm exploring as a filmmaker. You know, I think, I, and and I'll, I'll end it on this, but I think that, what what you discuss and what I've discussed in the past about doing our our respective films is that you ha- you know a lot of young filmmakers and just indie filmmakers in general they get caught up in the dogma of of filmmaking yeah. what they're told in books what they're told in schools that this is the right way of doing it this is the this is the way it's been done all this time and it's it's the few people who said fuck it. I'm not going to do it that way. I mean, Robert Rodriguez, you know, he did it his way. And, you know, all the guys from the 90s, Kevin Smith, Richard Linkletter, you know, all those guys, they did it yep. their way. Soderbergh, I mean, is is the poster child for that. Um, yeah. And, and it's really just doing – like Mark Duplass, I mean, seriously, or Joe Swansburg. Oh, yeah, the Duplass brothers. I, I mean, forget about it. I mean, the Duplass brothers, uh, Joe Swansburg, Lynn Shelton, all these kind of guys, uh, they, they just do – they're just doing it their way. And you know, I don't know if you've had the same experience, but I've talked to industry friends of mine who are like either TV directors or film, you know, you know, big time film directors and things like that. And I tell them my process for making Meg and they just look at you like deer in the headlights. Like yeah. they, they, they don't get it. They're like, what, 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 what do you mean? Like, I'm like, yeah, yeah, we shot, we shot it with, I, I had three people on the crew the entire time. Like, yeah. But, but how, but how did you get, how does it look like that? I'm like, right, well, I exactly. Did, like I did this, I did that. I'm the colorist on it, and all this kind of stuff. Yeah, and they just don't get it, and it's. I find it so invigorating, honestly. I, don't know I know it's you. like it's a lot of fun. It's like, oh, you guys don't know how the sausage is made. Yeah, yeah. You know, I remember. <laughs> you know, it's funny because I remember, like, at at uh, at the at the, in Seattle, I was on a panel with all the Catalyst filmmakers, mm-hmm. and of course, you get the question of like. What was the budget on your movie? Of course. And you go down the line and everyone's like, I can't tell you. I can't tell you. I can't tell you. And get to me. I'm like, I'll tell you. It was six grand. And then like all of a sudden you're the focus of that conversation because they can't talk about what they spent and they probably spent half a million dollars. And you're suddenly the like the spotlights on you because you're like, one, you can talk about it. And two, it's such a ridiculous number that everybody wants to hear about it. You know, a part of it, too, is like, you know, you've done this is like, how do you create a conversation around what you're doing? And get people to want to talk to you about it. How do you get execs to go, I understand how you made this movie for six grand. And then they want to meet with you. And then they want to talk about it. And then they want to find a way to like do what you're doing because mm-hmm. it's faster. You know, so it's just like it's a really interesting sort of position to be in and and sort of coming from that perspective of like, you know, it's it's what I said, and I, I know people who are like this where like, you know, they don't want to edit themselves, they don't want to shoot themselves, they don't want to take the time to learn, you know, but as a result, they're always going to be reliant on other people to right. make their films. Right. And if you don't have money, then you're asking favors. And who wants to keep asking favors for the rest of your life? Right. But if you're a guy who can shoot, edit, direct, produce, write, you know, we'll leave off music and sound mixing. But, you know, it, th- those are like five serious roles that you can do yourself. You're never in that position. The only person that's going to not get it done is you. Mm-hmm. You yeah. know, you have no excuses. Oh, well, I don't have a DP, so I can't go shoot. Go shoot it. Yeah. You know, like there's nothing stopping you. Just learn how to do it. And then all you need is a camera and you can get out and you can start creating content. You can start getting out there more and doing it more. But like, you know, in this low budget indie world, if you're always in a position where you need money, you have to have this, you have to have that, then you're going to be doing a lot of waiting. And clearly people have created a career out of that. Um, But like, you know, it doesn't have to be that way. I mean, and uh, and I'll go back to Soderbergh real quick. I mean, you know, he he did sex, lies and videotape, but on the same – 
the same method he did Oceans 11, 12, and 13. He, yeah. He lit I mean, them themselves. I had no idea he lit those themselves, and they're gorgeous. Yeah. yeah. I was having a conversation with um, Tim Smith at Canon who was telling me about how he was helping out Soderbergh on – what was it full frontal that like oh, weird digital movie? Yeah, yeah, back in the day, and he was just like, yeah, he's like, you know, we rented out a hotel, and he's just on the XL two and or XL one S or whatever, and he's shooting around. It's just like, you know, it was insane. We were shooting so much, and he was just doing it. And he was experimenting, and like, you know, he's like Brad Pitt sleeping on the floor next to me because we're all tired, you know. And and it's that same thing he did it with Schizopolis, where he just yeah. went off and like kind of made his thing and kind of like, you know. And so he's he's got that experience so that he can back it up and he can. You know, and then and then what's it really great about is then he's got a hundred million dollars that he can play with. You know, can you imagine? Yeah, he's and, like, oh great, and I'm do a, his right thing. Well, like he yeah, like, I'll, we can't go to a, a casino, so we're just gonna build one. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> that's what yeah, exactly. Then you have complete control. Like, uh, funny enough, my uh, uh, a very great friend, DP of mine, um, he does like grip, he'll do grip work in New York. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, to like whatever. But anyway, so he he did a grip work on, he did grip work on a pickup scene in Haywire. So this scene where um, Ewan McGregor and um, Michael uh, Fassbender are like talking in the pub. I don't know if you've seen the movie. No, I haven't seen it. Um, okay, but there, there's a conversation where they're they're talking in the pub, right? They're just having this conversation. So that was shot in New York. It was supposed to be somewhere else, but it was shot in New York. So he's like, so Paul was like, my DP friend, he was like, yeah, so Soderbergh comes in. Everything's already set up. He's got his two red cameras. He's got two monitors. It's already set up for the shot. He's like, they basically shoot the scene, you know. Um, it takes them half a day to shoot this dialogue scene. Like that's it. And then they're like getting ready to go. And then somebody says, Oh, Hey, Steven in this, in this, um, show in the mirror, so, you so, can so, see, so, so, hard, sorry about that. Can you say that one more time? You just broke up. Oh, I was just saying, um, so anyway, so right before they were getting ready to break up and, and, and pack down, somebody pointed out on the monitor, uh, that you could see one of the, the flags or one of the like frames, mm-hmm. um, for the light, for the lighting, like in the shot, in the mirror, in the reflection. Mm-hmm. And Soderbergh looks at it and he goes, nobody's going to see that. It's like, that's it. <laughs> and like, true enough, if you look in the movie, you could see it if you're looking for it. But if you're not looking for it, you'd never know. And you know? That, mm-hmm. And it's like, it's just that kind of thing where it's like, you you get a, you know what you can get away with. And if you can do that, then you can shoot faster and you can shoot more and you can shoot better and you can shoot differently. And you can, you can get to a place of doing some really, really cool stuff because, you know, you're not letting stuff worry you. Yeah, amen, brother, amen. Now, where um, where can people find you? Uh, so the best place is Twitter. Um, my handle is at Joshua underscore Caldwell, mm-hmm. C A L D W E L L, or you can go to my website, Joshua dash Caldwell dot com, and that'll have news and all that kind of info, and you can just kind of branch out from there. Very cool, man. Listen, man, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you, man. I feel like uh, I found a brother in arms here, man. It's very yeah. Really cool. Well, you know, when I saw when I heard about you and, and uh, saw what you were doing, I was like, all right, this guy's gonna get it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. There's no question, brother. I appreciate you. Thank you for dropping some major knowledge bombs for the, in the for the tribe, man. I appreciate it. Of course, anytime. I want to thank Joshua for coming on and dropping major, major inspiration and knowledge bombs on the tribe. Thank you so much, Joshua. I told you it was going to be a pretty lengthy conversation, and it was, but I think it was well, well worth it. If you want to actually watch Layover and a a very extended behind-the-scenes interview on how he made Layover, you can watch it on Indie Film Hustle TV. If you want links to anything, you want to watch the trailer and stuff, I'll put it in the show notes at filmtrepreneur.com forward slash 009. And if you haven't already, please head over to filmbizpodcast.com. That's filmbizpodcast.com. Leave us a good review on Apple Podcasts or any place that you listen to us. Leave us a review. Subscribe. It really helps the show out a lot. Thank you for all the love that Film Entrepreneur has been getting. We got into new and noteworthy. Uh, my new book, Rise of the Film Entrepreneur, was uh, a number one a bestseller already in pre-orders. So it's really, really exciting and humbling for all the love that you guys have given uh, me and Film Entrepreneur. So thank you so much. And don't forget, man, please share this episode, share the website, share the link, share all of it to, with as many filmmakers as possible because my mission is to help filmmakers actually build businesses around their creative art, around feature films, around television series. That's why we're here at Film Entrepreneur. So thank you guys again so, so, so much. 
Oh, and if you haven't checked it out, go to filmtrepreneur.tv, which is our YouTube channel, which I am putting out new videos about five to six times a week. So little clips from other interviews and videos to help you on your film entrepreneurial journey. As always, the power is in your hands. Be a film entrepreneur. I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Filmtrepreneur podcast at filmtrepreneur.com. 